Please help me welcome Dr. Ann Webster. I'm sorry I'm late. Um, the train conductor forgot to tell me that I had to get off at Rhinecliffe instead of Kingston. So I went all the way to Albany Rensselaer and had to come back. So um, I'm practicing everything that I teach, let me let, tell you. <laughs> so, uh, I, I am a health psychologist and I work at the Benson Henry Institute, Mind Body Medicine in uh, Boston, Mass General Hospital. I'm also an instructor in Harvard. And I do a lot of things there. Um, I'm the director of the Mind Body Cancer Program, the Mind Body Program for Successful Aging, and the mind, I'm soon to start a Mind Body Program for caregivers. And then I also work with patients individually teaching relaxation techniques and uh, cognitive behavioral therapy. And I do a lot of lecturing at Harvard. We have training programs. If any of you are interested, speak to me afterwards, get my card, et cetera. So I want to begin um, my lecture today with a relaxation exercise. And I'm going to ask you to take everything off your laps and sit up straight in your chair. Unfold your arms and legs and close your eyes. And this would take about 10 minutes, OK? So just notice how your body feels right now. Notice the character of your mind. Just bringing your awareness inward. So whenever you're ready, take in a comfortable, easy breath and hold that breath a few seconds and then let it go. Take in another comfortable, easy breath Hold it a moment, and then let it all out. Take in one more easy breath. Hold it a moment, and then let it go. And then just allow your breathing to return to its regular pace. Just noticing that on every easy out you can become even more comfortable in your chair. Just breathing in and breathing out. Now, in order to recognize tension in the body and to let it go, it is easiest to focus on one part of the body at a time. So begin now to focus your attention on the muscles of your forehead. Move your eyebrows a little to get in touch with that part of your face. So the muscles of your forehead, the little space between your eyebrows, can become soft and smooth. Become aware of your eyelids, and they can now become comfortably heavy and still. And the little muscles around your eyes can become soft. Notice your cheeks, your jaw, your chin, allowing that little hinge of your jaw to just let go, so that now, all of the muscles of your face feel soft and smooth. And this feeling of softness can move down into the muscles of your neck and over your shoulders. Take in an easy breath, and as you exhale, imagine the tension rolling off the tips of your shoulders, just letting go of the cares of the day. Become aware of your arms and hands as they rest gently in your lap. Upper arms, lower arms, hands, thumbs, and fingers. 
as you relax, your arms may feel a little heavy and your hands may feel warm and tingly. And you might even notice your heartbeat in the palms of your hands. Now, if thoughts have come into your mind, just notice the thoughts. Oh, well, and bring your focus back to your out-breath. And you watch your out-breath, and you'll find that your thoughts pass for a moment. Bring your attention to your back, feeling your back gently against the chair. Allow the muscles of your back to relax, vertebrae by vertebrae, by vertebrae, by vertebrae, by vertebrae, all the way down to your tail. So that now, the entire top half of your body can enjoy the benefits of this relaxation. And notice the chair supporting your body, supporting you very comfortably, very securely. There's nothing for you to be concerned about at this moment in time, and there's no work for you to do right now. This is a time to simply be. And this feeling of relaxation can pass like a wave down into the lower half of your body. First your hips, upper legs, knees, lower legs, ankles, feet, toes. Feeling your feet against the floor. And from the top of your head all the way down to your toes. All of your muscles as well as your mind and enjoy this time of relaxation. This is a time when you restore energy to every cell of the body. It is also a time when healing can take place in body, in mind, in spirit. Healing does not happen when we are racing And this feeling of relaxation can stay with you as long as you need. You can return to this peaceful state whenever you wish, simply by closing your eyes, taking those three easy breaths, holding each breath a few seconds, and then letting it go. In a moment, I will count backwards from three to one. And when I get to one, slowly open your eyes. Come back to the room, feeling peaceful and calm. Alert, focused, ready for the afternoon ahead of you. Three, two, one. And just notice how your body feels right now. Notice if you feel differently than when you came into the room. So this is the very first intervention that we offer to people in mind-body medicine. And I think of it as the earth we stand on and the air we breathe. This is given to our patients as a prescription. And they are given, um, I have uh, my CDs. I give my CD to the patients. And they're required to listen to them once a day because everybody who comes to mind-body medicine needs to quiet their minds and quiet their bodies. 
okay, I'm learning how to relax, doc, but I want to relax better and faster. I want to be on the cutting edge of relaxation. So isn't this why you're here for the next hour? So I love this metaphor. In mind-body medicine, uh, we think of overall health as a little three-legged stool. And when you're talking about mind-body medicine, this is how you can uh, think of it. The first leg of pharmaceuticals, many of my patients are taking medications, chemotherapy, um, pain meds, whatever it might be. It's a very important leg. The second leg, surgeries and procedures. And many of my patients are going through uh, various procedures, and that's an important leg also, but the little leg cannot stand on two legs alone. And what mind-body medicine is all about is the third leg here, which is self-care. And this includes relaxation, stress management, cognitive therapy, nutrition, exercise, getting enough sleep and rest, what a remarkable concept these days, humor, spirituality, et cetera. What sets this leg apart from the other two is that this is our patients doing things for themselves. The other two legs, people are doing things to them. So this is very empowering. Uh, in my groups, they go for 10 weeks, and every week I'm teaching something different. And these are um, the, the topics that uh, we teach. And uh, the mind-body programs are not support groups where people sit around and complain. People are there to learn self-care skills. So I talk about stress and how stress affects us physically, emotionally, cognitively, spiritually, etc. I teach the relaxation response, which is what we just did. We have stress reduction strategies. I have another lecture on resiliency. People who are resilient are vitally engaged in life. So we have an exercise. I teach yoga, and I tailor the yoga um, postures to uh, the physical conditions of people in my groups. Nutrition is a huge part of mind-body medicine. I'll come back to that later. Cognitive restructuring is paying attention to your negative thoughts and uh, see that your thoughts create your moods and feelings. The moods and feelings don't stay from the neck up. They trickle down and impact upon us physically. Discovering how our negative thoughts are distorted, illogical, out of proportion. Challenging the thoughts and coming up with more rational ways of thinking and feeling. So that's a, a two-week um, portion of the 10. Spirituality just evolves, and you can define that any way you want, and then social support. And I think one of the best things in terms of working in groups is getting people together who have common threads. And um, listen to this. A number of years ago, I think it was 1994, a group of researchers from Duke went around in America asking people, how many close friends do you have? And in 1994, on average, people said three. They came back to, um, uh, to go around America again in 2004 asking the same questions, and we were down to 1.5 close friends. But 25% of people in America in 2004 said they had no close friends, zero. Well, you know that that's worse now. And the people from Duke said this is not too difficult to figure out because people live in the suburbs, they get in their cars, they drive away, they have no idea who's living next door to them or down the road, etc. Or we live in high-rise apartment buildings, we don't know who's above us, below us, beside us. But they say this is very serious because you don't have close face-to-face -face contact with people, you're isolated and you become depressed. They also feel that um, we work in office cubicles and we don't know who's to the right or the left, or so many people are working from home, sitting in front of computers all day long, no face-to-face -face contact. So a huge component of what we do is social support. 69 to 90% of the problems that bring people to the doctors are stress-related, and yet when you go to the doctor, very few doctors ask, ask, do you have stress in your life? Mine certainly doesn't. And not all stress is bad. There are many very joyous things that happen in our lives. I see a new baby in the back here. Obviously, a new baby is joyous, and, um, but it's stress. So not all stress is bad. What is stress? This is how we define it in mind-body medicine. It's a perception of a threat to one's physical or psychological well-being, and it's a feeling that I can't handle this, I can't cope. So any idiot can face a crisis. It's often the day-to-day -day living that wears you out, and I could testify to that just trying to get here today. <laughs> now, this is stress physiology. This is what happens in your body. Most of us are, are pretty much aware of we have muscle tension, we're braced for action, our jaws are clenched, right? Gets a little bit more subtle here. When you have a stress, your heart rate increases. There's an increase in blood pressure. 
clearly there's a link between stress and hypertension. A need for oxygen, breathing rate becomes rapid and shallow, palms and face sweat. There's an increase in blood sugar, and there is definitely a correlation between stress and the development of diabetes. Uh, increase in adrenaline, noradrenaline, your digestive tract shuts down, blood vessels constrict in hand and face. Over here, most people have no idea that this is going on when you're stressed. So this is what's going on in the brain, right? You have a lot of stress, your perception becomes very narrow, and you don't see the big picture. It's very difficult to store information and retrieve information. Um, we're very defensive in our ways of reacting to things, and our view of the future is negative. So all of this is going on when you have stress. Maybe you notice muscle tension. Maybe you notice that your heart is pounding, right? But a lot of other things are going on. This is... Um, Bruce McEwen's work. Um, Dr. McEwen is at Rockefeller University in Manhattan, and he's written a book called The End of Stress as We Know It. And McEwen says, if we go through life like the bottom line, so say you get up in the morning, and uh, you jump in the shower, and there's no hot water, but you manage to calm down, and then you get off, and you get on the train going to Kingston, and they don't tell you to get off, so here you are by 10.30 in the morning, you're already stressed, but somehow you manage to calm down, and you get home at night, and you know, get on your computer, and you have some upsetting emails, somehow you seem to calm down in order to go to sleep. But according to McEwen, this is not what is going on in America. We are going through life like the top line. So say you get up in the morning and you get out into nasty traffic and you're going to be late for work or late getting here, whatever it is, calm down, you get off to your office, you get all kinds of emails, and there you are by 2 o'clock in the afternoon. Then you get home at night and you have an argument with your spouse or your partner or your children. And look at your stress level at the end of the day compared to when you popped out of bed in the morning. This is most people in America today, and Bruce McEwen calls this allostatic load. The bottom line is allostasis. And all the tools that I offer people enable them to go through life like the bottom line here. You just kind of learn to roll with things. Okay, so this is what's happening in terms of stress uh, uh, physiologically. There's an increase in blood sugar, blood lipids, Blood pressure, work by the heart, hyperventilating, risk of blood clotting, cold hands, cold feet. Uh, also, cortisol, which is a stress hormone, uh, takes, has a toll on this, that's the uh, body as well. But what's most important is this one. Cortisol um, has an impact upon the immune system. And you have, let me see if I have a model of this. No. Uh, there's a whole field of research called psychoneuroimmunology, PNI for short, and most of the work has been done by Janice Keiko Glazer, Ron Glazer, Barbara Anderson, uh, Ohio State University. And they have determined that if you have a lot of stress in your life, it increases anxiety, depression. When people are depressed, they isolate themselves and they're lonely. That emotional upheaval then has an impact upon the immune system, and the immune system is suppressed. So your body doesn't make as many T cells, B cells, macrophage cells, and interferon, and this can lead to disease progression or the onset of some sort of an illness. So I always say to people who come to the Mind Body program, be so happy that you've come back, you've come to a program that's going to give you the tools to deal with stress so that you keep your immune system in good shape, particularly my cancer patients. Okay. Um, here are physiological stress warning signs. We actually even have... Um, a mind-body program for infertility uh, up at Mass General. And then over here on the lower right side, this is stress taking a toll on the immune system. There's clearly a link between stress and all kinds of cardiovascular problems. We have a cardiac program, and we know that IBS, the brain, and the gut are hardwired. So a lot of these things um, are really made worse or caused by stress. So here's a guy, you can't see this, um, it's, I couldn't sleep, it says. He, he brings his car into um, his bedroom when he couldn't sleep. Okay, here are emotional stress warning signs. So uh, people get very irritable and angry over small things, have little uh, temper tantrums. Restless, can't sit still, worrying about things that worrying won't help. That's all the what ifing that we're doing at 3 o'clock in the morning. Bursting out into tears over small things, you can't concentrate, and becoming depressed and isolated. Now, I took this photo years and years and years ago out on Route 9 up in Boston, and um, 
I don't know about around here, but Boston has horrible traffic jams, and they honk a lot. They're very rude drivers. And these were out in Route 9, and I'm looking at these guys, and they were out of their cars throwing things and cursing and yelling. And, and um, I love to ask people when I, I see this kind of thing, are you making traffic go faster? I'll probably get stabbed one of these days doing this. <laughs> Have any of you ever been to India? It's an incredible country. And uh, I was there a number of years ago. The trains aren't this bad now, but this was a number of years ago. Imagine if you had to do this to get here today, clinging to the top of the side of the train. And they're all, if you look at them, they're all very happy because they're going into Calcutta to um, do some work. We have cognitive stress warning signs that people lose their short-term memory. And here's hard-charging businessman Billy Sloan, who's about to learn that continued stress inhibits one's memory as he goes out of his house without his trousers on. And I actually had a fellow in one of my groups do this. <laughs> He's getting dressed in the morning. He has his socks and shoes on, shirt, tie, jacket, briefcase in hand. He leaves his apartment. The door slams and shut. He gets to the elevator, pushes the button, and finally looks down, and he's standing there in his boxer shorts. I've had many patients go off to work with two different shoes on. And my favorite story, um, a woman went off to, to her office, and she got on the subway, and she had a great big wooden hanger in the back of her coat. And nobody said anything to this poor woman. This big metal hook sticking out here, right? She finally gets to her office, takes off her coat, and clunk out falls the wooden hanger. So we're mindless, right? We have cognitive stress warning signs. What you think you become, what you feel you attract, what you imagine you create. And uh, for any of you who are interested in cognitive behavioral therapy, these are the diary sheets that we give to our patients. And they keep track of a stressful event. It might be, um, I can't sleep. Filling in the first three columns, and there's no primacy here. So um, emotions might be anxious, frustrated, annoyed, uh, automatic thoughts. I'm never going to get to sleep. I'm going to be a mess tomorrow. And people are going to notice, why does this always happen to me? And we go on and on and on. Physical signs, muscle tension, guaranteed not to be sleeping. And then people dis discover how um, their thoughts are distorted. People magnify things, they're jumping to conclusions, fortune telling, etc. Positive thoughts might be, I can handle this. I'll take a few deep breaths. I know how to calm myself down. Um, maybe I'll sleep better tomorrow, whatever it is. How do you feel when you have thoughts like that? You feel calm. You feel optimistic. That's CBT. So jumping to conclusions doesn't count as exercise. We have spiritual stress warning signs, and this gets a little bit more subtle. Life has no meaning and purpose, losing the capacity to be kind and empathic, losing a sense of connection to self and others. I think bullet four is very American today, believing that acquiring more and more things are going to make you happier. If I just had the latest iPhone or the latest iPad, all my problems would be solved not practicing altruism. Uh, there have been a number of studies. How many of you volunteer? Oh, good for you. This is a great group, <laughs> big hearts. There have been a number of volunteer uh, studies that have shown that altruism is good for your health. And there was a study done out in Minnesota where they interviewed 2,700 men who volunteer on a regular basis, compared them to 2,700 men who never volunteer. And the men who volunteered uh, regularly were far healthier, statistically significant fewer instances of headaches, chronic pain, depression, insomnia, and if, I think hypertension was the last one. This is not difficult to figure out, and those of you who volunteer understand this. You do something out of the goodness of your heart for others, it makes you feel good psychologically, and then that trickles down and has an impact upon our physical well-being. And just to tell you a little story, in my... Um, Mind Body Program for Successful Aging. There was a 79-year-old man, and he was listening to everybody's um, wonderful experiences about volunteering. And he had a history of cancer. So he decided that he was going to go to Mass General and go through their training program, which he did. And he is now giving out coffee and tea to patients who come into the oncology unit for chemo treatment. It has totally changed his life, 79 years of age. So here's a big spiritual stress warning sign. You can't see the caption, but it says, I'll have a nice day when I get damn good and ready. Usually people say to me, how did you get my husband up there on your PowerPoint? <laughs> 
So this brings me to the relaxation response, and this is a state of quiet in the mind and the body, calms down the sympathetic nervous system, and calms down all of that noise up here in your mind. And we practice this, you know, at the beginning of my talk. And I work with a very, very, very famous cardiologist, Herbert Benson. Some of you may have heard of him, who 47 years ago was looking at hypertension in monkeys up at Harvard. And a group of people came to his lab and said, we want to show you what we could do to our blood pressure by meditating. He sent them away. I'm not interested. I'm not interested. They came back. He sent them away again. So he finally had them come in at night after all of his colleagues were gone, hooked them up to the blood pressure me measuring uh, devices. They sat down, closed their eyes, and within minutes, their blood pressure went down. And, and Dr. Benson said, you know, I don't know what this is you're doing, but I'm going to get my most hypertensive patients in here, and you teach them whatever this is. So he got a group of his patients. They practiced meditation and were able to get their blood pressure down into a normal range and get off their meds. And that put Dr. Benson on the map. So we've been teaching the relaxation response ever since. Oh, I'm going to skip these. Okay. These are the various techniques that I use, and uh, we do all of them. I teach meditation, diaphragmatic breathing. As I mentioned earlier, we do yoga stretching, progressive muscle relaxation, mindfulness, prayer, uh, sound. Uh, one of my best friends up in Boston um, is the head of music therapy at Berkeley School of Music, and the two of us are collaborating. We want to do a study. Um, looking at music uh, and meditation at end of life, and we're hoping that Dana-Farber will um, accept that. Uh, prayer, repetitive movement. I want to come back to imagery. I use imagery a lot. Do you know what the most common form of imagery is? We're masters at it. Worry. So I use imagery a lot, and I'm just going to share some stories with you. Um, and athletes use this all the time to sort of, you know, prepare their bodies and their minds for an event. And once they get there, they've already imagined how they want to be, and their body performs that way. So uh, one of my cancer patients, he had biliary cancer. And he came to me and he said, you know, my white blood cell count is low. Is there anything we could do that I could imagine my body making more immune cells? I said, of course. What do you want them to look like? So he wanted to see his uh, immune cells as uh, turquoise sparkling stars. So I worked with him twice, uh, and we would sit quietly and do the basic relaxation, and then he would imagine, he'd put his hand here on his chest, and he would imagine his body making, you know, masses of these turquoise sparkling stars spewing out of the center part of his body and going all around, uh, targeting different areas, but basically keeping him healthy and strong and well. We did this twice. He went in and had his blood work done, came running into my office, and you're not going to believe this, but my white blood cell count is back to normal. I had a fellow who was eligible for a new chemotherapy. He went in and had his blood work done. The nurse comes out and says, I'm very sorry, we can't treat you today because your platelet count is too low. So he came to work with me because he wanted to see his body making more platelets. And I said, okay, how are you going to imagine them? He said, well, I have colorful pottery plates that I got in Mexico, so I'm going to imagine that I have an assembly line of those in my body. So we did this in my office, and then he practiced two or three or four times that evening, ended up going back into the oncology unit the next day, pleaded with them to do his blood work. The nurse had told him, you know, give yourself a couple weeks to recover. His platelet count was up sufficiently for him to get treatment. Now, my last favorite story is a patient that I see in New York City, and she's had ovarian cancer three times. And I see her almost every Friday. And she came into my office one Friday, and she said, I can tell my cancer is back. I have a feel like I have a mass in my groin. You know, it's impeding my walking. She went and had scans done, and sure enough, there was a mass in her groin. So she scheduled for Welcome surgery. Welcome to the 14th Annual the Women's said, Health and um, Fitness Susan, come Expo my coming up at 12 o'clock. I just want to do one more scan we have to be sure where I'm going to uh, Joy where the mass Bauer is. From and NBC's I'm use your Today old Show. That's at noon or a little bit after Joy in, Bauer, NBC's scan Today done, Show and then on the main stage. The hospital. If the doctor is in booth at, at noon, we have Dr. Nagaraja, a board-certified infectious disease doctor. In the workshop room, Pooja A.J. Thompson on getting organized. 
on the fitness stage, Danae now Schnauber. Seeing this mask getting on the chef's smaller demonstration and smaller and smaller area, and smaller. we have Chef Linda Soper Colton shower, on easy plant-based lunches on the run. Those are all coming up way. at noon. And she said, you know, I'm going to have you open me up because I have scans. I know what, the, uh, what this looks like. I'm going to go through the surgery. They open her up. There's nothing there. So I have a lot of stories like these, and um, it's just fun. It's just using your mind to influence what's taking place in your body. So that's imagery and visualization. Well, the trouble with you, David, is you don't know what the word relax means. And most of the people who come into my office look exactly like this guy, David, clenching their fists, clenching their jaws. <laughs> and if we're walking around with this much tension, we're not breathing. I'm going to ask each one of you to extend your dominant arm. Make your elbow as tight as you possibly can, and now make your fist as tight, tight, tight as you possibly can. What's happening to your breathing right now? Holding it, right? This is just tension in your arm. So if we're walking around like David, we're not getting an exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide, so no wonder we're exhausted by the end of the day. I had a um, patient who said to me, you know, Anne, I can always tell when I'm stressed because I'm wearing my shoulders as earrings. <laughs> so, I teach people to breathe. I think, do you have handouts from me? No handouts from me? Okay. Um, one of the things that I teach um, in terms of breathing are called minis. And I wish I had brought a sheet on minis. But I'm going to ask you to sit up straight in your chairs once again and unfold. And minis are little short relaxation techniques that don't require a CD, an, a, you know, a headset or anything. It's just you and breathing and breathing and counting. So the first mini we're going to do, we're going to um, count down one number on each out breath. So you'll breathe in and you'll think five. As you exhale, you'll breathe in four. And we'll work our way down to zero, one number quietly on each out breath. So close your eyes once again. And whenever you're ready, take in a comfortable, easy breath. As you exhale, think five. Breathing in, four. In, three. In two, in one, in zero. Open your eyes and come back. You notice in just five breaths, we feel a little bit calmer. You can do minis with your eyes open, your eyes closed. Here's another one. Have any of you read um, anything by Thich Nhat Hanh, Vietnamese Buddhist? This is his favorite mini. On the in-breath, you think I am. On the out-breath, at peace. So close your eyes then. And you take in an easy breath, thinking I am. Exhale, at peace. Breathe in, I am. Exhale. Peace. Breathe in, I am. Exhale at peace. Open your eyes and come back. Okay. Uh, there are many, many conditions that um, have been improved simply by practicing relaxation techniques. And um, I'm not going to go through all of these, but I'm sort of on a mission at Mass General to get these very simple techniques into scary places in the hospital. And uh, a couple of years ago, I did a study with men who had just been told they had prostate cancer. They were terrified, scheduled for radiation. I met with each man for 45 minutes before um, they went through the procedure. And they would tell me, you know, how frightened they were. And I taught them just the techniques that I've done with you so far. And starting at about week three, I would hear radiation is a piece of cake. And last year, I did a study with a group of women who were scheduled for uh, breast biopsies, which is another scary thing. And I met with each woman for 45 minutes before the procedure. And the nurses didn't know 
which group um, the, the uh, women were in, my arm of the study or the controls, but after the study was over, they said, Anne, we could tell they were much calmer. Your arm of the study, the women were much calmer. They didn't cry. They didn't move, etc. So these things are so simple, you can take them into all kinds of scary um, uh, procedures. Look at the quote on this. I want to be sure that everything and everyone in my program is doing some kind of exercise. When I first saw this, I thought, this, is, this has got to be fake. But this woman was a former dancer. And uh, she could do the splits anywhere. But the exercise that I teach is yoga. And this is, I'm not eating, I'm self-medicating. And as I mentioned earlier, nutrition is a huge part of mind-body medicine. And I have a brilliant um, nutritionist who comes to speak at both of my groups. He'll talk about what your plate should look like, good fats, bad fats, um, cancer-fighting nutrients. The most important thing, get chemicals and additives out of your diet. When I started, um, yes, <laughs> when I started doing this work 28 years ago, most of the uh, people in my cancer group were in their 50s, 60s, 70s. Now they're in their 30s and 40s. What is that all about? It's got to be something that we're eating or drinking or breathing or putting on our skin. Uh, the nutrition, talk about supplements, things like that. So there's a whole lecture. Uh, we talk about mindfulness, and mindfulness is being present and focused and in the moment. Imagine that I'm standing here and I have a flip chart. And I'm going to make a square here, and I'm going to label it past. We spend about 40% of our awake thinking time ruminating. I should have, I should have, I could have, why didn't? Right? Then I'm going to come over here, and I'm going to make another square, and I'm going to label that future. We spend about 50% of our awake thinking time worrying about later today, tomorrow, the next day, on and on and on. And you can't even know about 6 o'clock tonight. So you've got 40% here, and you've got 50% here. What's left? A tiny little slice of time. Maybe 10% of your day, you're actually present and focused and in the now, and that's all we have. So everything I try to get people to do is to be present. We do mindful listening, mindful eating, mindful conversation, mindful bathing, etc. This is mindlessness. This guy's doing at least six things as a pedestrian. I would never want to walk in front of him. And I don't know if any of you know of uh, Ned Hallowell, but he's the head of the... Um, Hallowell centers in Boston and in Manhattan for people who have um, ADD and ADHD. And he's written a book called Crazy Busy. And in his book, it talks about the myth of multitasking. Our brains are not wired to do more than one thing at a time. So if you multitask, you're actually stopping, starting, stopping, starting, and you're wasting time. So don't let your mind wander. It may never come back. I'm going to give you this little assignment every day the rest of your life, I want you to do something new or good for yourself. Now, you don't need to start until Monday because coming here today is a new and good that's going to last for three days, or at least three days. These do not have to cost uh, money. They can be very simple. Uh, you can't see the caption here, but it's, it's two girls with a box of chocolates that says, let's just do the top layer. <laughs> now, if our nutritionist were here, he would tell you expensive dark chocolate is actually very good for you, so you have my permission. This is also another thing that I use with my patients, and um, they keep attitude of gratitude journals. And why do I do this? This is based upon the research of a fellow named Robert Emmons, E-M-M-O-N-S. If any of you are counselors, social workers, psychologists, write his name down. He has a book out called Thanks and another book called Gratitude Works. And Emmons uh, did studies. He had um, a group of people, randomized a group of people to one of three groups. A group that was going to keep gratitude journals, a group that was going to keep journals about benign events, and a group that was going to write about nasty events. They wrote in their journals um, each day for eight weeks. The group that kept gratitude journals were far healthier um, than the other two groups. Statistically significant um, uh, increases in socialization, taking better care of themselves, physically and emotionally, exercising more, changing diets, uh, more optimistic about the future, goal setting, etc. So that's Robert Eamons. It's one of the reasons I have people keep attitude of gratitude journals. And when my patients talk about things that they're grateful for, it's like the best antidepressant in the whole world. Right? Well, I'm telling you, Ed, you've got to learn to deal with tension better, poor Ed. And when the only tool you have is a hammer, you tend to treat everything as if it were a nail. And hopefully in my 
brief presentation, I've given you an, a nice overview of all the tools that we offer in mind-body medicine. And I want to just I end all of my talks with um, an inspirational reading. And I think this is what today is all about. This is from a book called The Color of Light. Each patient carries his own doctor inside him. They come to us not knowing this truth. We are at our best when we give the doctor who resides within each patient a chance to go to work. And that's Dr. Albert Schweitzer, who was a brilliant scientist and physician. This is all of us here today, and this is what this conference is all about. Living inside me is a great knowing doctor, a healer. Am I giving this doctor a chance to work? When I am afraid, in panic, I rush about, looking for something to take, looking for someone to do something, always looking outside myself. When I act out of my fear, the doctor within can't help me because I am not present. The doctor is in, but the patient is out. When I calm down, when I relax and breathe, when I center myself and bring my attention back to me, my healer can go to work. Sometimes slowing down is all we need to do. Other times we may need to ask the healer in us for advice. We may feel awkward at first. Like any relationship, it takes time to build trust. But after a while, we'll both be very comfortable with each other. Many times today I will consult my internal doctor, the healer within. I will slow myself down and ask for his or her advice. I thank you for being here. Nobody fell asleep. Thank you for waiting for me to get here. Thank Enjoy you. the rest of the day. It's just going to be wonderful. Dr. Ann Webster.